So I changed, I changed the title of mine to Action Sports because it, I, I'm not really a motorhead. So motorsports doesn't really uh, lend itself to me, but I do like to uh, photograph stuff that's moving. Um, and I'll start with the motorsports. And when we talk about motorsports, I don't go to this car track. I forget who, who was it? Uh, uh, somebody already did this uh, in, in, a, uh, in a talk with our group. But, uh, there's a couple uh, uh, motocross tracks in our area that are really fun to, to visit. And the reason I like to visit them be, is because everything's always changing. Everything's always moving. You never know what's going to happen. Um, it's fairly easy to get some action at, at these tracks. Uh, there's uh, three different types of tracks. I'm going to show some samples. This one's uh, just north of Birdsboro, if you know where that is. It's called the uh, uh, Pagoda Motorcycle Club, and it is a motor motocross track, and they also have a flat track. One thing I want to mention first is you're going to get dirty. There's a lot of dust. Um, so if you're going to bring equipment, don't bring uh, anything that's fabric as far as bags, because you're going to be, you're not going to be able to get the, all the dust out of it. The, one of the things I really like about it is you get accidents like this. Um, I was practicing. This is one of my first attempts at, uh, at panning. And I thought I really liked it. It was, it's one of those little accidents. So I like to do landscapes. I like to do um, wildlife. I like to do abstracts, every, everything we talk about in the club. But the nice thing about these types of environments is the action comes to you. You don't have to hike to the top of the mountain. Um, and you can stand in one spot and get all kinds of crazy stuff happening in front of you. So this is a, a pan that I, I used even a slower shutter speed. This I caught the rider a little bit better. I'm still not that good at panning. Um, and then this is a little bit slower pan. This is, this is a, a track down near Coatesville. It's fairly flat. So you don't have to climb up and down the hillside uh, to get these shots. And they do let you, uh, they probably wouldn't let a whole group, but they do let you stand in the middle of the track, not the actual dirt track, but in, in the infield. As long as you sign the waiver and say you're not they're not responsible if you get hit by the bikes. So I'm getting a little bit slower on my feet. So I don't I tend to stand behind a pole instead of in front of the pole these days because things do happen quickly. And there's a lot of things flying around, including some bodies, and you'll see a little bit later on, and including some of the bikes. I also like it because it's so colorful. Lee's going to do colorful birds later on but I like to catch the colorful uh, animals on their bikes. It's, uh, it's, almost, uh, it's almost like a safari because there's so much happening around you and you do have to stay on your toes. So this is a little bit different pan. These are all from that track down at Coastville. And it, like I said, it's, it's fairly flat, but they do have one jump in the middle of the track. So I do get some flying birds, Lee. Um, and this was a very colorful one right here. And it's not a big jump, but you'll see later on at the other track, there's some big air happening and the other thing that's kind of nice is these um these subjects appreciate getting their picture taken so when they realize that you're on the track they start to perform for you so when they start to catch the big air they start to swing their bikes around kick out their feet you know get get some air uh, and they're always looking right at the camera so you can stand in one spot and get all kinds of things happening on these tracks. So this is, this is another one. This is, that, this is called Piston Poppers. It's down by uh, Coatesville. Setting yourself up. This is outside the track. So I'm outside, the, I'm outside that fence. And this is one of my first attempts. So uh, it's not the best shots. But when you, when you set up and you wait for them to come around the corners, that's when all the action happens too, is in the corners. So you see that they lay their bikes down. Again, this is dirt tracks. So they're not laying it down like they would on, on the uh, concrete uh, tracks, but um, there's all kinds of action, lots of bumping happening in the corners. And this is not the best F-stop um, because I didn't get a lot of separation. You don't need a big lens at these tracks. I always take my 70 to 200 and the, the other reason I take the 70 to 200 is because when you take a zoom that extends those different tubes, because there's so much dust, a lot of these lenses will suck the dust inside the lens. So mine's, my, mine's all internal, so I don't get a whole lot of dust inside them. And I don't change my lenses once I'm there. 
unless I go back to the car, close the door, and then change my lenses because there's dust everywhere at the end at the end of the day. They do water down the track, so it does get muddy. But uh, uh, on this day, it was about 100 degrees. I always seem to show up at the tracks when it's 90 or above. Um, so this is the other. This is the other track. This is the Pagoda Motorcycle Club. This is when it's up by Birdsboro, right off 422. And this is the one where you do have to climb because it's on the side of a hill. And this is where this is a small jump. Um, it's nice to get multiple riders off the jump side by side. And you can see there's mud flying everywhere there. Now I don't have. Oh, I do have it here. This is a. This is at 130 millimeter. So I'm not that far away, but I'm far away enough. If they do slide out, they're not gonna take me out with them. So I, I only have a 200 millimeters and that's good enough at most of these tracks. A lot of the shots that you see tonight will be cropped, but they're not cropped that heavily at these tracks. So I'm standing in the infield or behind one of the berms or the, um, or the big uh, uh, straw bales to protect myself. They also do four, four wheelers up there. This really gets crazy because there's lots of bumps and there's lots of uh, stuff flying off of here. And they, they're always uh, jostling around. So once you get used to these tracks, you know where to stand safely. Um, the best shots are usually not the safest spots to stand because you're on the outside uh, of the turns, but this has a lot of ups and downs and you're climbing here. So you're, you're climbing up and down the hillside uh, to find different spots. Nice thing about these tracks too is uh, they run the they run the races back to back to back. So there's not a whole lot of downtime. You're not waiting for the next the next race. So they they just go from uh, about nine o'clock in the morning till almost uh, almost four o'clock in the afternoon if you want to do the whole day. Um, they do have practice. It's going to start in March. Uh, they're going to start doing practice runs, and they they invite anybody uh, to come take photographs. So this is where I'm on the inside corner and a lot of dust is flying to the outside. So I, I kept the mud off of me here. I have so many pictures of people. I have no idea who they are because um, I don't race. My son doesn't race uh, on motorcycles. Uh, this is the small jump. Uh, even there, they're getting some air. This guy right here started to do a lot of hot dogging because he was way in the head. And once he knew where we were standing, uh, he was doing a lot of flips and kicks with, with his bike. Okay, again, just more. Uh, they're about seven feet off the ground right there. That's again, one of the smaller jumps. Some more panning. I was starting to get a little bit better at panning. That's really what you want right there is to see a lot of action in the wheels. So I'm not freezing the wheels, but I'm trying to freeze him. So I'm trying to pan with him and get that big blur because that's about how fast he's going around those corners. If you use a shutter speed that's really fast and you freeze it, you really don't get the feel uh, of how fast these guys are going. And you, I don't think I have any of the little guys. That's a lot of fun because they're on the little tiny and they're, I think they're about five years old running the same track as their dads. Uh, of course, they're not going as fast. And uh, lots of girls uh, ride on this track too. And I don't know if I have any, but uh, there's some with uh, big ponytails hanging out the back flying uh, in the mud. This is the guy that started hot dogging for me. And um, they do buy your photographs. If you, if, if you uh, go back enough times and they know who you are, they'll start buying photographs. So they'll ask you, where is your photographs posted? If you have an online gallery, uh, a friend of mine does a lot of this. He, he should actually speak on motorsports because he's addicted to motorsports. And he's actually going to be running his dragster at Maple Grove. So I'm going, to show, I'm going to show up at Maple Grove this year because I know somebody who's in the cars now. And he just inherited a, a dragster and he's going to be running it. He's just turned 60 and now he's getting into drag racing. Okay, just more of, more of the same. They're jumping. Ideally, you really shouldn't get them on a gray sky like this, silhouetted. You, it's best to, uh, to show where they're jumping from, because you don't know how high these guys are. These guys are probably about 10 feet in the air now because they're towards the end of the race and they're really uh, flying over the, the, final, uh, the final jumps. You don't really want this to happen on the track, but it does. And you do want to be there when it does happen. These guys were mixing it up towards the end of the race. And I didn't realize it until I blew it up in the PowerPoint presentation 
there's all this blue stuff around their feet. And when I zoomed in, he has a leak in his radiator hose. So it's blowing, it's blowing coolant all over the place. I thought that was something wrong with my lens, but you can sort of see the water, the blue water splashing all over. They're, they're just touching right here. And I'm on the outside of the, um, of the track. Um, I'm using my 200 millimeter here. So I'm far enough away where when this starts to happen, I'm safe enough. So they bumped. Now you can see his hose is broken. You can see all that blue coming off of his, off his radiator hose. The guy in the blue, he's the one that face planted. And I do have three or four more in the series. I just cut it down to those three. He was fine. He was more pissed off than anything else. Um, he got up, but he really did face plant. He rolled his bike. Luckily, didn't hit him or me, um, but he was coming straight at me. Uh, he was in one piece. His bike was in one piece. He got up and he got started. So that was good. Uh, but that does happen quite a bit. Uh, usually, you're not in that perfect spot when it does happen. This is something else they do. Um, the, this is the flat track. And this you can get a lot of really nice shots on this because it's an oval. It's an oval, it's flat, and it's more of a pack uh, race. So they're coming around the corners and this, this day was horribly dusty and you wanted to stay upwind, not downwind because when the wind changed, I was eating a lot of that dust. Um, I'm, I'm kind of glad that we have masking because it gave me an excuse to put a mask on in this corner because when the wind changed, it was all in my lungs. All right, so getting them stacked up together is really nice. Uh, these guys are laying it down in the corners because it is flat track. You can see those, those boots on the inside. Those have big metal plates on it. Uh, so they, they're sliding uh, on the inside, holding themselves up. And uh, they're all walking around like big Frankensteins when they're not on their bike because they're clunking with those big, uh, those big metal boots. But a lot of color, a lot of action, a lot of intense looks. You can see the one guy, you can see his intense look. And I do have some, but I don't have them in the presentation where you, if you zoom in really close, um, you can really see their eyes are fixed. They're laying down on top of each other. Now, this is another, this is another um, we'll, say, we'll call it motorsports. Uh, they just started running this again. There's a lot of downtime if you go to this, but it's really cool because they have all these classic bikes and cars running through the streets of Coatesville. So if you know where Coatesville is down, down below Route 30, and they do this, I think it's in July, sometime June, July. Uh, it was brutally hot that day, um, but they run it through the streets. And the problem with this one was there's a lot of downtime. So you stand around talking to a lot of people who are really into the cars, and I don't know much about the cars, um, but we're photographing uh, just a mix of different, uh, different types of uh, motorcycles in this case. This is in the city streets and they have it all lined with, uh, with uh, fencing. And these guys are flying and they are racing, but it's not the kind of race that, uh, that uh, you see on the track because it's a, it's a total mix of all these different uh, vehicles. There is one uh, that's a couple, I, I, th I don't know if it's a uh, husband and wife, but uh, they had that sidecar and she was hanging out off the side, uh, going around the, um, around the corners and around the hay bales. So this is just in the city streets. Problem here is I'm getting all those people in the background. I didn't blur them enough. I really didn't know where to stand here. Um, and I didn't wanna walk so far because it was brutally hot on the city streets. But the one corner, I stood with the cops down there and I was talking to them uh, uh, quite a bit. And it, they just come around this corner. There's no good backgrounds where I was standing. Uh, if I go down this year, I'm gonna go up at, at the top of the city streets because I think there's better shots up there. But if you like one cars- One minute, Bob. What's it? One minute. Sure. Oh, that's one minute. Okay, I thought you said, hold it. Okay. Okay, so they're, they're, if you're in the cars and these classic racing cars, this is a real good place to go. Uh, because they do have the pits and these guys and these guys and women, there's some women drivers in here too. They really like to show off their cars. A lot of these are rebuilds. Some of them are, are, are from the track and they used to run the track. Uh, I think a couple of them were from like Watkins Glen area. They, they race up there and some of them uh, uh, refurbished some of these cars. So they're really proud of their cars. 
And uh, I don't have the oldest ones here, but they have some really cool old cars running through the streets of Coatesville. And they used to run them so, too fast. So they started to put down a hay bill. So they had the chicane through the, through the, the straights. I have no idea what these cars are. If you do. Okay, Bob, time's up. Time's up? <laughs> time's up, yeah, sorry. That's all right, okay. I'm sorry to interrupt because it is fascinating. And I appreciate okay. that you put your life at risk for us to get, yeah. get some of those shots. There, there, Does anybody have any questions or comments? There was one question about your camera, Bob, and I believe it's a Pentax, but if yes. you could clarify. Yeah, it is a Pentax. It's not the best for these kind of shots um, because it doesn't track very well. Um, it, it shoots, it's a full frame, so it's only about four up to five frames per second. Uh, a lot of the people who shoot this, they shoot more like uh, six to 10 to 12. Uh, they're always sitting beside me. So, you know, it, my camera isn't perfect for these shots, but I can get enough. I, you didn't see all the ones I threw away. So, okay. so this, is, this is the other action sport that I really like. Um, I actually like this even better than motorsports. But these are, let me get to the slide. And then I'll give it up. <laughs> But these, these are happening right now in, in March. Uh, and the, the other one is hap, happens at uh, Labor Day at the end of the summer. Um, but the, the horse shows, the jumping, the, the farm show, the steeple chases. The steeple chases are actually going to start soon. That's why I wanted to bring up this, this slide right here. And then I'll give it up. Um, but uh, you can see that they, start, they really start in May. And uh, that's a lot of fun to go to because those horses are gorgeous and a lot of action. And it's totally different than the, uh, the motorsports because it's quieter, mm -hmm. right? All right, I'm done. Okay, thank you, Bob. Right. Um, Vince, you're up. I got to stop sharing. There we go. <clears throat> okay, this will be a, a little bit calmer than, than Bob's. Um, I'm gonna, there we go. Um, so I, I wanted to find something that was new and different for me, um, trying to be creative and go beyond my usual um, uh, landscape nature type of shots. Um, and I found this technique, which I thought was was pretty interesting uh, called In the Round. Uh, it was uh, brought about by Pep Ventosa. And um, um, he's a Spanish guy who now lives in California. And this particular technique is a form of multiple exposure along with intentional camera movement. And during the process, you deconstruct the scene and you reconstruct it to meet um, the creative thought that you had giving you an illusion to reality and not true reality. And the standard PEP method is to encircle your subject all 360 degrees, um, taking multiple images um, as you do so. He usually will be up toward 100 images. It could be done with only four. And then you blend these images to get your individually creative shot. There are variations in the theme of not necessarily going all 360 degrees around the scene. And these are a couple samples of Pep Bentoza's images, which have become quite famous. You can see that they are all not totally around. Like the, if you can see my cursor, the trolley in the lower right, he does some architectural work with this and with one of the variations in the process, um, uh, which is pretty neat. This is one of his most famous images in the lower left. So the technique, um, to describe it a little bit, um, it's best done with a stationary um, subject that is relatively strong and stands out and has very distinct elements when you look at the subject going all the way around it. And the lighting would be best if it was 
evenly lit, say on a cloudy day. When you, you survey the scene, you pick what you think might be the good base image for your, Im, for your final capture. Um, and then you circle that, um, that subject matter, uh, keeping the same distance away from the subject all the way around, say that a tree being 20 feet away from it. Each frame is exposed and focused individually. Um, and the object is to keep the main subject at the same spot. And I use a grid and would keep it say where the plus sign is here so that the orientation and the relationship stays the same from shot to shot. Uh, the, the images are imported into Lightroom uh, and each one is individually processed to get the right exposures to eliminate with uh, your clone tool or, or whatever the areas you don't want. Once you've worked all the images, for example, say 20, uh, the images would then be selected in Lightroom, right click and you'll get the edit in menu. And, and I'll show you an, a photo of that. And then you open these images as layers in Photoshop. And this is very basic Photoshop. Once you're there in Photoshop, you have some decisions. You have to figure which is your base layer, the main image that's going to have the greatest um, opacity in your final image. You can change the order. So you have to decide on the order of the various images. You have to figure the opacity of each image, anywhere from 100% to 4% as you go through each of the images. Um, and the images have to be aligned. So if you don't have your subject exactly at that crosshair, you have to, in Photoshop, move the images of the files around a little bit. And then you blend the images together. And that's another creative aspect of it. When you're all done that, you have say 20 images that you've now blended together. You flatten them to make one single image file. And then that image file goes back into Lightroom for final processing. So this is um, one of the examples like I had of my in the round um, made up landscape. Um, this was after a heavy rain. Um, in one of the local parks. And this was shot going completely around the bush um, with about 20 images. And then I blended those images as I wanted to in Photoshop to create a somewhat painterly surreal image. This is another much more simple image, um, uh, but it actually required significantly more shooting as you'll see in a moment an amaryllis plant on a stand on the lawn just to kind of demonstrate the technique and to try it again. This was actually much harder than the one before. Um, you could uh, have the um, your camera stand still on a tripod and just slowly spin the, the plant itself if that's what you wanted to do as another variation than compared to walking around. So these two images I have in Lightroom, and you'll see with the first one, um, I, I use the ones that have flags on them. So I used all 19 of the ones I shot on the first image. On the second one, I used the flags, and there may be around 30 of those. And then they were, I would right, highlight them all, right click. And when you right click um, <clears throat> in Lightroom, you have this edit in. and down at the bottom, um, open as layers in Photoshop. And then once you get to Photoshop, it will bring all those in, there'll be individual layers. And my 19, these are just four of them um, in Photoshop. This is a list of them here. If I were to scroll up, I would catch all of these. Um, the little eyeball will turn the layer on or off. I have to make some adjustments in the layers of Photoshop of the opacity of each image. If they were all 100%, that wouldn't work. They would block each other out. So your base image might be 90% op opaque, and then the other images would vary, usually in a um, lessening order as you go up the stack. And then you have to decide on the multiple layer choices of um, how do you want to blend these together. And for this particular image, I use the light. And as you scroll, there's a little downward arrow here, and there'll be about 
uh, a bunch of these, like, I don't know, 15. And as you scroll over those, it will show you the effect and you can figure out which one you want, um, uh, which one you want to be using uh, as you blend these. I indicated that you do not have to go with this technique <clears throat> completely around. This is a linear Pep Ventosa in the round type of, uh, of process that he might have used on the architectural structures, taking um, three images side by side and blending them. And the same thing here, this was five images blended together side by side, uh, as opposed to going around. It's a different way of multiple exposure. Um, just trying to do something creative. Um, there's a um, website I have circled here, um, Charles Needle. Um, if you were to go to his website and go under the resources tab, you could download what he has as a script for Photoshop for multiple exposures. And then when he'll tell you how in his write-up how to import that. And then when you open up Photoshop, you just click the button and it will do his formula, his algorithm on how he goes through a descending order from 90, 80, 70, down to 4%. It's a fixed order that you can then adjust if you want to. Uh, I haven't used this so much. I tried it, but I really like the customization that I have. It takes a lot of, a fair amount of time. I probably played with that red tree a couple hours in Photoshop, um, trying to figure out how to blend, how, how I wanted to blend each layer and, um, and come up with the final image. My next step, and I'm working on this now, is to try to perform in the round in camera. My Canon R5 will do this. You can take as many multiple images as you want. You can, it's set to go up to nine, and then you can use number nine as your base to take another eight shots. And then you use that as your base for another eight, and you can go on and do a hundred if you want. And then in camera, you can, it has four blending modes. Um, and for that red tree, you would use the, the dark mode, um, uh, but there are three other ones. You don't have, the bright would be the lighten mode uh, of Photoshop. It's obviously not the same control, but it's, it's another way of doing a creative multiple exposure, uh, intentional camera mo movement um, process in camera without the Photoshop part of it. Um, it will then blend the final image as a raw file. You can keep every image that you shot or discard them all because you do have the final raw. Um, and that's basically the technique. I've expanded a little bit more into multiple images. This upper right shot is in camera, blended five shots in using the dark mode for blending. The lower left is a in-camera five multiple exposure with a light blend mode. Um, not the Pep Ventosa type of in the round, but just in-camera multiple exposure. And with that, I will stop my screen share and avoided having uh, Cheryl hit me with the time clock and answer any questions that folks may have with that technique. That would be awesome, um, Vince, for you to share that with the club at like a club event where we get together. Sure, it would, I, I guess. Um, I, Vince? Yes. Um, you might want to take a look at Bailey and Chinnery, which are two Brits. Do you know them? I know them very well, yes. Um, um, they're actually coming stateside in October of this year to do a workshop up in Massachusetts, but they do incredible abstracts in camera, multiple images in an ICM. Yes. Um, um, two of my friends and now my brother have taken, my brother's in the process of their course. Two of my friends have taken their full course, which is extremely intensive, um, many hours of homework. And um, uh, I have learned some from the people who have taken the courses with them and I've, I've read a lot of their stuff, but thanks for the info about October. That could be pretty interesting. Could you put their name in the chat, please? Um, you want me to put the name in the chat? You, yeah, you, they, oh, okay, I can do that. 
the name of the artist that you rec that you mentioned. <clears throat> Any questions about the technique of it um, for me? Did you have fun, Vince? I had great fun. Um, <laughs> and actually, the 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 difficulty in Photoshop was uh, quite a learning experience for me. Um, so that part was fun. The, so the and the creativity was just. It was neat to do something that was different. And the amaryllis was on my my lawn. So it so, didn't even have to travel very far. Exactly. Not have to use any gasoline. Right. And it, I think it will have a lot of applications. The multiple exposure thought process um, uh, can have some really neat applications. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. That was cool. Sure. Thanks, Vince. I think you've left a lot of us dumbfounded because that's <laughs> it's a lot of work in there and you've done incredibly well. Thank you. Um, our next presenter or sharer is Jay, who's going to talk to us about his statuary photos. Take a look Thanks, in the Jay. chat. The link is down there. Thank you for doing that. Okay. So let me see if I can uh, share my screen with you folks. Hold on. Okay. Can you see this? Yes. Okay. Yes. So cemetery statuary photography. How did I get interested in cemetery statuary photography? in 2006 while attending the main media workshops, which is an incredible place to take a photo workshop. I took a day and visited Belfast, Maine, uh, about an hour north with a friend of mine. We were just driving around looking for photo subjects. Um, I was taking a photo workshop, so, so just uh, looking around for random photographic subjects. And as we were driving around, um, my friend, said all of a sudden in a very firm voice, Jay, stop. <laughs> and uh, it was at the location of the Belfast Cemetery. So I stopped and went in. And uh, I felt as we parked and I walked into this cemetery like I was entering into another world. It's literally like, that's how I felt. Um, Kind of like the movies where the, I forget the one movie where the kids enter into a uh, closet and they go into another world. That's how I kind of felt. Uh, so ever since then, it became a photographic draw for me. Why do cemetery statuary photography or why do I do it? No crowds of people. Most of them are in the ground. So I don't have to worry about people. The statuary subjects stay still, have unlimited patience, and don't talk back or need breaks. It's historically very interesting. It's a humble reminder to me of my own mortality and a reminder to myself to enjoy every day. And uh, the best cemeteries are beautiful park-like settings. Uh, they're wonderful places to visit and do photography. The larger, well-designed cemeteries, usually around cities, um, were designed to be places to console, remember loved ones, and have a healing connection to nature. Uh, in other words, they're made in a way to be like heavenly places to remember loved ones and just to relax. And the public, they were open to the public as well. So this is the first image that I, or one of the first images that I shot when I was in Belfast, Maine. And um, I had my two megapixel infrared converted camera. Um, and ever since then, I was just uh, really drawn to doing cemetery photography. Um, so I'm going to go through my images slowly, uh, tell you a little bit. Feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions. Um, or someone, if you're watching the chat for me, if they have questions, just let me know. I, I typically just drive around and travel and when I'm visiting wherever, um, most 
I haven't traveled very far. American cemeteries are pale in comparison to the ones in Europe, and I haven't visited the ones in Europe, um, Eastern Europe, Central Europe, uh, Italy, France, and England have amazing cemeteries. I've seen pictures of them. Um, we don't have much of that here in America, except a couple in the major cities. And what I do when I'm uh, driving around anywhere is I keep my eye out for interesting subjects. And one of the things I'm drawn to, of course, are cemeteries. And this is just a little itsy bitsy uh, country cemetery in Luzerne County. I photographed this on the way up to Ricketts Glen State Park. So you'll see a variety of techniques that I'm using. Um, shooting straight photography, doing some infrared. I use lens baby lenses. Uh, a variety of lenses, but primarily my 60 millimeter macro lens, which is great for this. I have a 75 millimeter lens, which I love, and a 12 to 45 variable focal length lens. So most of these are local. I haven't been able to travel very far for various reasons in my life, but um, try to find uh, places that I think are interesting and take advantage of what's close at, close to home. So you can find a lot of very interesting photographic cemeteries close to home. So this one here is just right in the little small town of Fleetwood. Um, this is a 40 to 150 lens to draw me closer to the subject and I shot it I think this turned out great, just a straight photograph converted into black and white. And then I also shot it another time in infrared, color infrared. And this is at the same cemetery. I, I like exaggerated color from time to time. It's not everybody's taste. Uh, so I like to experiment with a variety of different methods and techniques. Yes, sir. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute or put it in the chat and someone can ask me the question. I like getting up close to the subjects and seeing the, um, there is a term for the uh, microbial, bio, you know, the plant growth that's on the, the tombstones. I forget what that is right now, um, but it's not good. <laughs> It deteriorates, especially limestone. So many um, sculptures that I've taken pictures of uh, have, it's not uncommon to see them 50% faded away over the years. Do you bring any lights with you, Jay, or do you just use the natural light? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm embarrassed to say I just use the natural light and I get a lot of junk because a lot of times I'm not prepared. I uh, want to take uh, some instruction from Betsy. Um, I want to learn how to use flash <laughs> or better. I'm planning on using flash and also um, a loom cube type of light. Um, mm -hmm. uh, definitely that would come in handy very often. Um, I mean, I love the light on this one, and that's what made me, but it did look like maybe it was just natural light, but there have yeah, been some of them and that's had really neat light on them. So you're doing great with what with the sun. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, what I'm not going to usually shoot, Jay. Pardon? What time of day do you usually shoot? Whenever I get there, doesn't matter. Um, yeah, I, morning, afternoon, evening. Um, well, not, I haven't shot, you know, dark, dark, but late afternoon, I have sunset, morning, midday. Um, if I was to guess, usually it's probably um, nine o'clock to three o'clock in that time frame. But yeah, a lot of these, you're, you're not seeing the, the not so good ones. There's a lot of, um, a lot of cemetery sculptures um, just are dark and you don't hit the light right. So having 
skills and using flash and, or a loom cube, even just using a loom cube or a reflector helps tremendously. This is using a lens baby lens. This is also a lens baby lens. Okay, for those who don't know what that is, could you explain what that lens might be doing to change this image? Um, this gives a little bit of an aura or a glow to the image, uh, which to me fits in well with an angelic subject matter, gives it more of an angelic aura or a glow around it. That's what a lens baby lens does. If you're not familiar with lens baby lenses, they, um, they do different effects depending on the lens you have. They might blur part of the image uh, where another part of the image is in sharp focus. They can give a slice of focus where if you're running your, um, you see a slice or a, a diagonal line or a horizontal line, depending on which way you tilt it. Uh, that's in focus. Um, lots. If you look at the Lens Baby website, they have a lot of neat lenses, and um, I think they're great creative tools. I don't think they're gimmicks, depending on, of course, how you use them, like any other tool. So I like using them from time to time, um, and a lot of times I'll shoot a straight image, and then I'll throw on the Lens Baby lens and experiment with that. I like to play, go out, and have fun, and play. Um, And also some of these black and white ones, I have an Olympus Pen F, which has a great uh, film simulation that, that mimics uh, Kodak Tri-X. So some of these might have been created using that film simulation. Jay, in reference to that, there was a comment from Jim Kessel about how much he likes your effectiveness with your black and white choices. Thank you. Yeah, this is a good one here with um, using the Olympus Pen F with the film simulation. It, it does a great job, in my opinion. And um, I'm totally okay with that. Um, and the other neat thing that it's very humbling uh, to be in cemeteries, uh, to see all the baby tombstones. A lot of times they use lambs on baby tombstones. Um, and, uh, you know, you see all kinds of little stories people put on tombstones and um, how they remember their loved ones. It's, uh, very humbling, very quieting. Do you use a polarizing filter, Jay, on, to get the sheen off the granite? Sometimes, uh, if I remember to put it on. But yeah, definitely, I have it with me. This is using a lens baby lens. I wanted to uh, keep the focus up here and just do a little bit of blur at the bottom. Yeah, there is a term for this. I should have known it before this presentation, but uh, uh, this is all corrosive to the limestone. It's beautiful. I mean, the color is beautiful, but uh, the cemeteries that are the best, hopefully they have conservation people. And in the really popular cemeteries, they definitely have people going around cleaning the sculptures. It's like museums. It's like an outdoor sculpture museum that they have to maintain the sculptures from pollutants in the atmosphere. This is one of the um, more popular cemeteries in America, Mount Auburn and Cambridge. It's huge. And you're literally going into what's what's just like Longwood Gardens, lots of trails everywhere, beautiful gardens, beautiful trees, a big lake. 
um, a gazebo near the lake, just like Longwood, something like you would see at Longwood Gardens, except there's thousands of tombstones and sculptures. And I also shoot Holga film from time to time. I like that just to mix things up, give me some variety. Also the Holga film um, gives you a unique look, uh, which I think lends itself well to this sort of photography too. I love it whenever I come across a semi, I'm a dog lover. So if I see a, a dog tombstone, especially, I, uh, I'm on it. Not the most attractive dog, but it was a dog, so I took its picture. This is right on Route 61 uh, near Mount Carmel. I don't know if it's Mount Carbon. <laughs> I might have that wrong. I think it's Mount Carmel. Uh, north of Pottsville on 61. It's right along the highway. There's a reference in the chat to um by Debbie um, regarding your lichen and algae um, that people might want to check out. And Dave also has a pin drop location for a cemetery he recommends outside of Philadelphia. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I think I know which one outside of Philadelphia. Oh, Hill, down by yeah. the Schuylkill River. Definitely, that's what's on my list. I meant to go with, a, with the Chester County Camera Club and Betsy, but I couldn't make that day. So whenever I'm out traveling, it's just a fun thing for me to do. I love doing it. Um, never an admission fee, never any hassles, just go in, enjoy. And like I said, the most beautiful, the most, the, the nicest cemeteries are just gorgeous places to go into. Like you're entering in, the best ones are like you're entering into another world, which is, I just love that. If you can find an old cemetery with old trees, just beautiful. I, sp I typically, if I find a place like that, I'm there all day. Just drop me off. I'm there all day. Thank you, Jay. You, yeah. Your time's up. <laughs> yeah. um, like Jim, I, I love the, the black and white. I also love the silhouettes. You've made really great use of the techniques. Anybody got any comments or questions? That's a double exposure there. I, I never would have thought this would be interesting, but Jay, this has been great. I, I love these. Thank you. Almost you have done. so many different techniques too. That, that's that's what really makes it neat. I like shooting architecture. And so I combine that when I'm in the cemeteries where the mausoleums and some of the ornate structures and carvings and things on the buildings of those mausoleums. Some of us get queasy in cemeteries. Uh, for some reason, I just don't like to think about them. <laughs> I haven't fallen. In, I haven't fallen in any graves yet. I think it's an emotional thing to me. I guess it bring, brings back some memories. Well, thank you, Jay. Um, now Bill's going to show us some event sure. photography. Hey, uh, Lee, could you do me a favor? And when there's five minutes left, give me a a heads up. I have quite a bit sure. of information I'd like to go through as well as if we could hold questions to the end or put it in the chat. Okay. Yeah, sure. So let's see if I can. Uh... You see in the screen yet? Yeah. Okay. I have uh... I say I'm an event photographer. I've done over 200 events in the last I don't, 20 years. I don't see the right screen, Bill. We see Pardon me? It. We see your mail screen. You aren't seeing it? We, we see, see your, your email. email screen. If you go back to share, you have to choose which um, screen you want to share. 
Hold on. You say you are not seeing it? We see your email. Is that what you want us to see? <laughs> no. <laughs> now we see your, uh, uh, yeah. No. How about now? Yes. Now we see fast stone image. Oh. How about now? There. Yeah. We're good. Tree and mountain. Yeah, I'm running dual monitors here. Grand Canyon. Oh boy. When you click share screen, it should give you the software program that you want to run or the screen that you want to run. What are you seeing now? My desktop? I and, see your... and a whole list of pictures. Desktop with your BPS. Yeah, there's an image. Yeah, that one with the people with clothing and bags, I guess. Well, this is really weird, guys. I'm going to stop, share, and try again. Still nothing? Still You'll get an option when you start screening, screen sharing to click on a, a screen that you want to use. Um, I had trouble with dual monitors too. Uh, so I ended up having to disconnect the second monitor. Bill, would you like Lee to move on and then come back while you figure this well out? I I guess let me give one more try here. Okay, well is, now we see your your um your it, Windows Explorer Finder, and we see all the little tiles of all your pictures. So if you double click on there, we go. Now we see your first picture. Okay, you're okay with that. We see your picture with people with sleeping bags, etc. Yep. Is that what you want us to see? Yep, we're okay. That's what we see. Okay, so let's so everybody can see that. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I've done over 200 events over the last 20 years. And when we think about events, we think about, um, yeah, you know, ballrooms and 200 people enjoying a, a $90 a meal uh, event. And to, to me, I've done a lot of different uh, events. This is probably one of the most e emotional ones for me, which was photographing uh, homeless people at Opportunity House. Here I'm standing with several thousand dollars worth of equipment, and these gentlemen don't know where their next meal or where they're going to sleep. My first few slides are just going to be showing a variety of the, uh, the different events, and then I'm going to highlight the different uh, types of uh, recommendations. Um, you know, superheroes at the ballpark, uh, choral events. I've done probably uh, close to 100 of these. Uh, and yeah, I've done several events uh, at the uh, at the Doubletree uh, and other hotels locally. Fiddle festival, uh, challenging ones where uh, performers are like in the uh, speckled hen uh, with a little light and I've got to shoot at ISO 6400. Uh, because I do not use flash because it's highly not recommended. Um, I did an event this past weekend at the, uh, at the museum. Regardless, whatever the event is, and no, however familiar I am with the uh, venue, I always, always, always have a checklist. If I don't know the venue, I'll go visit it so I know what to expect. So every time, no matter if I've been there 50 times, I have a checklist. And when I'm packing, I double check. I don't do a lot of action uh, events. I do three golf tournaments um, each year. I do, um, you know, I, I love doing these uh, action shots, one two thousandths of a second with a long uh, telephoto probably end up with 2000 shots of which I whittle it down to probably a hundred. 
Um, I photographed the uh, Reading uh, Pro bike race several years ago. Um, that was challenging because these pro bikers are very fast. Um, this, I want to talk a little bit about this. There was a fence um, uh, along, the, along the way. I wanted to get some low angle shots. So I hung the camera upside down with a wide angle shot. He's looking uh, for this one was at 1 60th of a second, as opposed to this was 1 2500th of a second. I like getting different angles um, of, of, the, of the events. This again was with a camera upside down along the street, wide angle lens, telephoto compression as they came around the corner by the pagoda. This is one of my favorite shots. Uh, towards the end of the race, it was poured. It was awful. I was down at the corner by second and uh, pen under this little tiny uh, overhang. And I was able to get, um, you know, get this shot, which, you know, you look at it, it's out of focus, of course, the rain was pouring. Uh, the event coordinator really liked that shot. Okay, um, I do a lot of high angle shots. Um, I always 90% of the time have a monopod uh, with me. I've switched to mirrorless several years ago, mainly because event photography, when I'm holding the cameras, I shoot with two cameras. Uh, and I have a cane in one hand, one camera, and I have a strap. Um, I usually use a 16 1.4 with a monopod. This one was at the planetarium with an eight millimeter fisheye on top of a monopod. Again, a ballroom, high angle shot. You know, a lot of the events I, at, I at attend, uh, the audience is there to have a darn good time. And I always try to capture audience members having a good time. These two ladies were just wonderful. This would probably take me just a, a mid-range zoom. I have long zoom, short zoom, mid-range zoom, fast primes. Um, these two ladies were <laughs> always, and these kids, kids love some of these events. This is one of my favorites. This young boy was just enthralled watching his parents dance, listening to the music. You know, all of my event photos, I consider snapshots. They really, you know, they really aren't uh, something that you're gonna hang on a wall uh, typically, but this young man, I just love that image. One advantage with the wide angle on a monopod, um, I usually talk to the band beforehand let them know if it's okay if i come up to the edge of the stage and try to get a couple of high angle shots again people having fun women love their picture taken at uh, some more of these more uh, formal uh, formal events i like to work the crowd so to say so to speak i never take pictures of uh, anybody eating and uh, you know you can tell by their faces they're just having a great time of course, I think, uh, you know, for a few glasses of wine and a couple of old fashions are having a great time. Um, I've done a lot of events out at the um, uh, Evergreen, although I think this might be um, up near Stokesa, that um, German, the German place. Kids having fun doing line dancing. timing you know i like to be in a obtrusive i don't want to be part of the action um this was sergeant uh or deputy sheriff P Pagerly's uh widow uh sergeant i'm sorry deputy sheriff Pagerly was killed in action they had his canine partner uh, as part of the family. And after Jinx passed away, there was a ceremony out at the Heritage Center. I was sitting in the front row, had a small mirrorless camera just kind of hanging down by my side. And when he, they presented her with a flag, I got uh, this shot, which the family really appreciated. Uh, again, timing, blessing of the animals, had a long telephoto. Um, this girl fishing, she was so happy. 
again, I didn't have to ask her to pose. She came up with a fish, a big grin on her face. This is Dave Klein doing one of his um, events at, uh, at the church. He raised his arms for about two seconds, and I got that shot. Um, this is a gentleman, Mr. Fairman, was giving a talk on uh, Auschwitz and was pointing out his serial number uh, that was tattooed in his arm. And I was, you know, I say lucky enough. I mean, it was another very emotional uh, event uh, that I photographed. This is uh, Alex Meixner. Uh, he loves this image. It was just, you know, going crazy at the accordion. Black and white. There's some venues are very difficult uh, with the lighting. Atonement uh, Lutheran Church uh, has terrible mixed lightings. So sometimes if I give, I just give up trying to process, I'll convert it to black and white. Also, when I crop, sometimes I usually crop and give it a little bit of an angle. <clears throat> I was down near the, uh, the ground when this gentleman came through on, the, on his uh, hand bike. And this is one of my uh, favorite black and white images from one of the concerts. I used to do a lot of for um, uh, Burke's Country Fest, and I've done uh, the Blues Fest a couple of times. Talk a little bit about wide angle. One of my favorite tools is the wide angle um, lens. You just, you know, I couldn't do some of the events uh, without it. Uh, a fast prime, I have a 1614, a 2314, a 35-14. Um, and really they're part of the, uh, my toolkit. A little bit about this one. Um, this was over at um, the Scottish Rite for their anniversary concert. That's the Ringgold Band. They wanted a, a, a picture. We couldn't get, they couldn't do anything up on stage. It was just too much clutter. So we said, okay, let's go down into the entryway. Um, Luckily, I had a 12 millimeter lens with me in my monopod because I was actually down below. As you can see, the ramp goes down, 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 and I was even lower. I raised the camera and with cameras and lens as high as the monopod would go. It was too high for my uh, remote release, cabled, uh, put it on a timer, and I was lucky enough to get, a, uh, get this image. Sometimes you need a lot of luck. Again, the wide angle. Five minutes. Okay, thank you. Five minutes, we'll yeah. make it. Um, Good. The, the wide angle lens can really provide some unique uh, experiences. You know, in this particular case, I was permitted inside um, the, the fenced area and uh, was able to get uh, some cool images. Um, again, higher angle shot uh, down at Opportunity House. Um, always try to to catch the emotion of performers. This was one at the Blues Fest. This was when I was actually down in the pit, which was difficult for me because I can't stand up. I had to actually crawl over to the edge uh, when, time, when my time was up. Lindy or Ortega, beautiful young lady. My favorite, Hannah Violet Phillips. I don't get pictures of drummers very often because usually the rest of the band is in the way. This is Jake and the 18 Wheel Gang, a little bit of HDR on that one. One of the Shell Sisters. We're almost done. Um, I've been lucky enough to go into some very nice places of worship. Uh, a few years ago, I was down at the Cathedral St. Peter and Paul about a week after the, uh, the Pope had been there. Uh, and they permitted me to go up into the balcony. One thing, I, I like to have my verticals uh, straight. And even though I think this was with probably a fisheye, I was able in post-processing to get the verticals right. The white balance looks out of whack on this, but it's, it's actually pretty accurate. That's the church down in uh, Potsdam. Greek, Helen, Greek, Helen Orthodox Greek Church in Wyomissing. Christ Church. In Reading, in a couple of weeks, a month ago, um, they've opened up the uh, the Bear uh, Chapel in Reading after about a million dollar uh, renovation. I usually get to these places at least an hour ahead of time, so I was able to get uh, this image. 
as well as one with a circular fisheye, which I left uh, as is. So that was quick. I'm done. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. I apologize for the uh, the trouble with the, the screen sharing. That's fine. That Those final images are just spectacular. Um, I've never seen anything like it. Thanks, Bill. Any mm -hmm. comments or questions? Bill, there was one question from one of the members um, about image release. Releases uh, not for the concerts of the performers, but say the the children or the homeless shelter. Yeah, um, I've worked with the uh, uh, Opportunity House and also the children's home and had uh, per permission because it was usually the other ones were like a public event. Um, the, the homeless uh, people, I had the uh, written author authorization of uh, Opportunity House because I think they were using it in a uh, uh, an appeal for funding. To explain what you're doing, Bill, you, these are charity events, right? Uh, well, 90%. I've been, uh, there was a few paid. I, uh, a couple of times I got paid by uh, Burke's Country Fest. Uh, for some of those, uh, but a lot of them are Opportunity House Children's Home. Uh, we did breast cancer support services last year. There's uh, 60 different nonprofits in um, in Berks County. I probably have done 10 of them. I do a lot for the Running Coral Society. So this is all uh, charitable work on your, mostly almost oh, all charitable crap. work on your you know, part. Real, for real, giving real back to our community. Uh, so. Yeah. Uh, we thank you for that. And yeah. real quick, when, when we do these events, they are looking for fairly quick turnaround because they use it on social media. So I usually within 12 hours of the end of the event, have the images ready uh, for the, uh, the various organizations. Again, it depends on what it is. Thank you. How tall thank is you your monopod, Bill? Bill? Pardon? How big? is your monopod i've seen them up to 25 feet with well i actually do have a painter's pole also yeah. that i've used that was i think it's 14 feet i think i i only use that once or twice but my monopod i think is uh standard 80, height. i think it's 72 or 80 and then i raise it up okay um now debbie's going to share some travel photographs with us over to you, Deb. Debbie? Yep. I'm okay. Getting ready here. <laughs> okay. Yes, I unmuted. Um, share screen. And there. Can everybody see that? No, not yet. Uh oh. What did I do wrong? Let's go back to this. Uh, share. There you go. There you go. I missed a step. There we go. Now everybody can see? Yes. yes. Okay, very good. That's good. My talk is about travel photography, and I'm calling it Photography on the Fly. I, my name is Debbie, and I joined the Berks Photographic Society in October of 2018. I am a picture taker who is working to improve my skills to become more of a documenter and eventually a very amateur photojournalist to be better able to capture the essence of my trips. My photographs are taken to illustrate my travels and to share with my family and friends who do not travel. I began to travel in 2000 with a Minolta film camera. I would pack many carefully numbered canisters of film for each trip and have all those pictures printed. This became quite costly when I began to take more than a thousand exposures during a trip. In 2009, I changed to my first digital camera and Olympus. Currently, I'm using a Panasonic Lumix with a Leica lens and 30 times optical zoom. My cameras have all been point and shoot ones. My travels have been as a tourist and not trips specializing in photography. 
I am with a group of other tourists following a tour guide to see the sights. Let me describe myself as I take a tour. I am walking on uneven surfaces like cobblestone streets and going up and down stairs. I use a walking stick to help prevent me from stumbling. I am jotting down brief notes to go with my photos, so I have a small notebook and a pen in hand. I have my camera at the ready, plus extra batteries in a pocket. I am listening closely to the guide who is giving more information than my brain can possibly absorb. And I am attempting to compose reasonable pictures in any weather condition possible. Needless to say, it can be a bit of a challenge. I have selected a few photos from some of my travels to share with you. We're going to start with, this is Yellowstone National Park in the geothermal area. This is my first exposure to geothermal areas and I was quite smitten with them. This was the only, these two pictures are the only ones with my film camera with my Minolta. So this is Yellowstone National Park. And we were lucky to see Old Faithful going off. So there's my picture of Old Faithful. Now I'm in Iceland. I'm now using a digital camera, my Olympus. This was the glacier walk that we signed up for, me and my travel partner, Mary. The glacier is Solheima Jokel. And we were outfitted up like we were going into the Arctic to do this, complete with crampons. But we did walk on the glacier and it was quite stunning. That gives a, just a couple views of the many pictures I took. We also saw many beautiful waterfalls in Iceland. This is Selja Landfoss. And as I stood there and watched it, because of the sunlight and the way the waterfall was throwing off mist, we got to watch the rainbow form and disappear, reform and disappear many times. I was trying to wait for no people to be in my picture. That's one of the challenges when you're on a tour is you're always trying to shoot around people, but I finally gave up so you can see the little teeny people in the background. I traveled to Greece. This is the Acropolis. That was quite inspiring. Santorini Island was a beautiful place. If you like living on a dormant volcano, which is what it is, the whole island is a giant dormant volcano, but still very beautiful. I love the old, the old windmills. And my favorite from that trip in Slovenia, Predjama Castle. It's a medieval castle that was built into a huge cave. Whoops, I went too far here. There we go. This is a trip in Germany. This is in Dresden, and it is the Green Vault, a museum dedicated to all the riches, all the fabulous jewels and things of the royalty. It's an example of the many beautiful buildings you see when you travel to Europe. Now we are in Merdleruth in Germany. This is some of the fencing that was the Berlin Wall that still remains as an exhibit. It's in a little tiny town south of Berlin itself, and it demonstrates how the Berlin Wall wasn't just in the city of Berlin. There you can still see one of the guard towers. It was a very sobering place to visit. Wittenberg is where we are now, and that is the mayor's palace in back of us and a beautiful statue in the front. I like statues too. Cruising along the Danube River, we're in Austria now. I love the chalk cliffs that you see when you're traveling in Europe. And the many small towns that you pass by when you're on a riverboat cruise 
and the, the different bridges that we can see. There's always wonderful bridges, colorful towns, beautiful little churches. The trip ended in Budapest in Hungary and through this archway, we're on a place called Fisherman's Wharf and you can see the Capitol building of Budapest in the distance. It's said to be the most beautiful Capitol building in the world. Patagonia is where we are now. And that was a, a very exciting trip. I love the different shorelines, the driftwood and the rock patterns and the watercolor and the plant material floating in the water. And of course, the scenery in Patagonia is absolutely stunning. Glaciers in the background, a little creek in the front. My favorite part of that trip, I should say one of my, one of my favorite parts, was Magdalena Island, where you walked around the penguin colony. You stayed on the path. The penguins had the right of way, which was hysterical. They just walked right in front of you absolutely fearless. And we got to see their burrows and their youngsters. This is a, a mated pair. Next, we travel to Kenya. I took this picture because I like the dirt roads. We drove on through the many national parks that we visited and this acacia tree by the side of the road. In the background, you can see the mountains. And this is one of my favorites is the, the common zebra reflected in the little lake. Part of the experience when you travel to Kenya is you visit a Maasai village. So here the residents come out to greet us. They dance and sing for us and then we're invited to tour a home. Not the way I would like to live, certainly but they seem to like it. The, um, the young chief, it's this person right here, the young chief did tell me that if I gave him four cows, I could be his wife. He's not married yet. I declined his offer. I said I didn't have any cows. And of course, what would a trip to Africa be without elephants? And we got to see lots of elephants, all ages from newborn babies on up. Probably one of my most favorite pictures, uh, I was fortunate enough to see this leopard while we were, actually it was our first day of our safari in Kenya. Our guide was all excited. He said, it's so uncommon to see leopards. It's the hardest of the big five to see. And we got to see this leopard. I was thrilled. Hmm. Next, we journey to Peru. And Peru, I will always remember because this was March, the beginning of March of 2020. And I was in Peru when it closed its borders. And I was stuck there for, I think it was 16 days to go. I managed to get out. They closed the borders due to COVID. So we were touring and had 24 hours to get out of the country. Needless to say, we didn't get out of the country. Also, what... <laughs> One of the challenges, and which I didn't notice till I returned, was that my lens was a little crooked on this trip. So all my pictures of the part that we did tour are out of focus on the right-hand side, which you will notice. I ended up having to replace the camera. They couldn't fix it. We're driving along. This is a shepherdess and some of her llamas. I love this area. We're quite high up in altitude between 12 and 16,000 feet. This is the Colca Valley and the Colca River down here. To the far left, you can see the, the little tunnel. We drove through that, wonderful switchbacks. There's nothing like switchbacks in a bus. I always enjoy that. Whoops, I did it again. There we go. And we went to 
the region of the Andean condors and got to see many condors soaring and swooping around. This was probably my best picture, a stationary one, but I was proud to have gotten that. On Lake Titicaca, the indigenous people make islands. They're called floating islands. They make them by cutting great chunks of the rush-like grass and then tying them together. When they have them big enough, they float them out into the island and anchor them, and then they build their houses on them. You can see the typical houses in the background made out of the same grass material. And this is one of the women and her baby coming out to greet us as we visited them on their island. We're looking out over part of Lake Titicaca. This was where we were told we had 24 hours to get out of Peru. To the kind of middle right, you can see the beautiful hotel that we were staying with. It was truly an island paradise. This is an island, it's Isla Suwasi, where we were staying a gorgeous place. Now we're back to Greece. We're in Corinth. This is the temple to Apollo. And that's a different view of the temple to Apollo. I like the berry bearing tree in front of the temple. And these flowers in the ancient wall just captured my fancy. So I took a picture of them. And that's the end of my picture tour. Thank you, Debbie. They were fascinating. I, that leopard shot looking over the shoulder is a killer. I just love it. I Anybody? Go on. I was thrilled. Anybody got any questions or comments? Very nice, Debbie. Thanks for sharing. My pleasure. You've been so many cool places, Debbie. I like to travel. That's that's my one luxury. Well, Debbie, I remember we had a um, a meeting <clears throat> scheduled, and okay. there was concern raised that you were trapped in Peru to, while we were supposed to be. Meet, we were. I think we did have our meeting because you were the topic of discussion. We were all kind of worried about whether Debbie was going to ever make it back to Berks County. Well, Debbie was happy to get back. Let me tell you, it was it was um, quite a memorable experience. And I have to admit, I did have to really think whether I wanted to keep traveling or not after that. But uh, we were very fortunate because we ended up in a in a nice hotel that opened itself to trapped tourists. Basically, we weren't the only ones. There were people from all over the world trapped there, and. I was amazed there were more than 10,000, I guess they were up to more like 13,000 Americans trapped in Peru. I had no idea that many people went to Peru. Debbie, what is your next adventure? I'm next off the end of this month. I'm going on a river boating trip in the Netherlands and Belgium. Oh, wonderful. I like the okay. company Viking. They do very fine river boats. And they also do smaller seagoing adventures. So their ships never have more than 900 passengers, which is nice. And the river boats have one to 200, depending on the size of the river. It's a very, very uh, intimate way to travel. Okay, off, we're gonna have a different speed now. We're going to night photography with Karen. Okay. Can you, whoa. Can you see the screen? We see it. Yep. Really? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the green, there was a green thing around it before, but I guess that's gone. Okay, so I first started looking at the stars and trying to do some night photography about five years ago. I took a glass out west. And this is, these are a couple shots from the class. We were supposed to be in arches, but 
the park was closed at night because they were paving all the roads. So we never got to take any nighttime pictures at arches. So this was just an arch along this road south of the park. And this is a closer, <laughs> closer up. We walked up to the actual hole in the arch there. And that's the instructor posing for us while we're taking pictures. One of the problems I have and I continue to have on this is the white balance from picture to picture. So the last picture was more gray than black. This one's more of a bluish tint to it. So I still struggle with that in, in Photoshop, trying to get all that stuff correct. But Lee said our pictures didn't have to be perfect for this, so it was good. This is another picture from, it was a state park in Utah that we went to the one night since we couldn't go to Arches and the instructor again, this was the moon rising. The instructor was there with a light panel doing the light painting for us. Karen, was that national parks at night? No, no, it was just a, it was a man from Philadelphia who runs some tours. This is Monument Valley and this is, I think the only picture in all of them that wasn't taken with my, I have a Canon T3i, which is about 10 years old now. It's a crop sensor, not one, not one of their, their better crop sensors, but that's what I've been using for 10 years. And this one was taken with my 18 to 135 lens, which has a, a 3.5 aperture. The other pictures, I think every single one of the other pictures in this presentation will be taken with my, it's a Tokina. 11 to 20, and it has an F 2.8. But this was right as the, the stars were coming up. So there was still some, some light around. This one was a panorama of several shots that I took. And at the time, I didn't have Photoshop. So the instructor combined them all for me. This is another thing I struggle with. I, I have a tough time getting panoramas to actually fit together. They always have big holes in them. So I've been pretty unsuccessful. I don't know if you can see my cursor over here, but this one has like a, this upturn here really isn't, I don't think the, the land really did that. These are just star trails for about an hour. And the, down at the bottom, it was, it was kind of hazy or cloudy. So that a lot of the stars you couldn't really see. <coughs> this again, the instructor processed this one for me. This was right outside our hotel, right in, in Monument Valley. And this is probably one of my favorite pictures. Now we're back at a more usual site for me. This is in Shenandoah National Park. And I've gone up there a bunch of times taking pictures. And this is just the big meadow skyline drive. There's a, a huge meadow here where you can just walk out and there's not much there's trees and rocks and different stuff that you can use as your foreground, but it, it's, it's pretty dark. So it's a nice place to take pictures. It's a little scary sometimes though. Sometimes other cars come by and people get out and you never know what they're up to. This is just a, one of the road pull-offs in Shenandoah on Skyline Drive. And here again, I don't know how you can see it on your, your pictures, but have kind of a bluish tint to this one, more so than a lot of my other pictures. And this one I light painted, and, and the last one too, I light painted myself with a flashlight, just a cheap little flashlight. I don't have anything fancy to do that with. And this isn't the moon, this is a, a planet. This again is another pull out along Skyline Drive, and that's my car. And again, you can see now that the I went back to a black tint instead of the bluish tint. I can't decide. And I, I have a lot of noise in the pictures. I don't know how much you can see that on, on the screens, how much that translates on the screens. But I'm, I'm working on that in Photoshop too, seeing what I can do about the noise that I get on all these star pictures. This is in Rhode Island. It's on a the lighthouse on a, an island called Block Island, which is about a half hour boat ride from Newport News. And this, now I'm back to the blue sky. 
this lighthouse you can't get, it has a lot of vegetation around it and there's fences, so you can't get that far away from it to take a, a really wide shot unless you have a really, really wide lens. So this next shot, I was kind of struggling to get the, the lighthouse and the Milky Way in because I couldn't, couldn't really back up any farther. This is from farther down in the beach of the same lighthouse. And one of, the, one of the scary things here was I had to walk along the beach to get back to my car and I wasn't, I didn't really landmark it very good in the, the daylight. So I wasn't exactly sure where I left my car. So I had to go up on the beach a couple of times to try and find where my car was. This is the, another lighthouse on Block Island. And it really does have that greenish light on it. They do that to identify it from some of the other lighthouses in the area. And this, this one has been turned into, or they were turning into like a bed and breakfast. I'm not sure if it's finished or not. I mean, this was like four years ago, so it probably should be open now. But this one was right along the road, so there was no, no walking involved to get to this one. And again, I like, I'd like painted this one so you could see the lighthouse. This is down on the Outer Banks. This is on the island of Ocracoke and more light painting. So I've just painted this, the pier. And the, it is really dark there along the beach. <laughs> if you have never been to the Outer Banks, it's a really cool place to go to take star pictures. This is a lighthouse on Ocracoke. This is the Ocracoke Lighthouse. And I stopped taking pictures because it was cloudy and it was really bright under here and there were no stars, but I really liked the way this one came out. This is about maybe 10 or 15 minutes worth of stars as opposed to normally I take like at least an hour to try and get the star trails. And these I put together in star stacks. And this one, there was a fair amount of light here. So my ISO was about 800. Usually I'm up to, to 3,200 on almost all the other pictures I've taken, but there was, there was light in the area. So. Oops. Uh. User error. This is a pier that it was damaged by a hurricane. I don't know if you can see where the pier kind of ends here. And I don't think I, I don't remember light painting this, but there was a lot of light for, coming from the shore because there's hotels and condominiums and stuff behind it. And this has since been torn down because it was, it was deemed too dangerous to leave up there. They thought it was going to fall down. So it's not there anymore. This was at Frisco Pier. This again is moonrise in, in the Outer Banks, right near Hatteras. And this is the Hatteras Lighthouse. And there's, there's a, like a cell tower over here that has all of these red lights on it. So there's a lot of red in this, in this picture. I, I don't know, I'm still working and work in my Photoshop skills to try and correct the light and the, the color balance on these things. I did light paint this lighthouse too. This is a more recent picture of, of Hatteras. This was last October, I was down there. I took some more pictures, again, with, with the light painting. This one, the, the Milky Way was out, like right after sunset, the other pictures, when I've been there, I've had to get up at like two o'clock to go see the Milky Way at two or three in the morning if you go down in, in the early springtime. This is pointing directly at the North Star. And this picture, I kind of had to cheat because there's a fence around the lighthouse. So I kind of, in Photoshop, I got rid of the fence and took the base from another picture and pasted like this part of the base in. And you can kind of see up here where I had like a tree branch coming in here. And you can see where I took this star here from over here. I flipped this around and put it over here, but you can kind of tell that they're identical. And it doesn't, it doesn't match up exactly correctly. So that's another thing I need to work on in Photoshop. This one is, is two shots and they're four seconds at 6,400 ISO. They get the, the beams looking like that. And again, I light painted it. So it's, Aaron, it's two what, I'm sorry. What kind of light are you using to paint the lighthouse? 
<laughs> I just have, it's a $5 flashlight from five below. <laughs> okay. And Karen, do you, you go these places by yourself at in like two o'clock in the morning? That would make me nervous. Um, this one was like, this was just after sunset, but yeah, yeah, I've been to here, here at like two or three in the morning. It doesn't get scary until somebody else comes. That's what I mean. <laughs> yeah, <as well. laughs> I don't know. A couple of times at Shenandoah, people have come walking through that big meadow and I just kind of freeze where I am and turn everything off and like cover my face. So they can't, you know, they can't find you there. Oh. And, I, and I never know what they're doing. The one time this guy went back and forth and back and forth with a flashlight through this big field. I don't know what he was doing. And then he left, but he never, he never yelled for anybody. So I, I was just frozen in place when that was going on. Cause I had no idea what he was doing and he could have been looking for me cause my car was parked right there. So maybe he was a ranger and he thought I was in trouble. I don't know, but mm. he didn't say anything. So he didn't, you know, yell out and say, I'm a ranger. Is that everybody okay here or whatever? So I just, I just kind of pretended I wasn't there and he went away. Uh. <laughs> Whoops. Wrong spot. Okay. This one, this is another multiple shots of the light beams. And this one's two second beams at 6,400 again with more light painting. And this one I had on the light painting, I had to paint like each shot. I painted like a little part of the lighthouse at a time. So that when I combined them, it would put all the, the spots together. So like I, I painted, light painted like this section for two, two, one, two second shot. And then this section for one, two second shot. And this, this section for one, two second shot. Cause otherwise I couldn't, in two seconds, I couldn't paint it to get it light enough. So to really show up. But this, this has a lot of grain in it cause it's at 6,400. This is Body Island and these light beams are from one shot. This is just one like 30 second exposure at 2.8. And there was a lot of haze, a lot of humidity in the air. So that's what caused those light beams to show up like that. And this, there's a, there's a boardwalk that goes out from the lighthouse that has like a little gazebo on it out sort of in the marshy area. And you can walk out there and take pictures of the lighthouse at, at night. And that, that's kind of neat to do. And this again is, is just one picture, even though there's there's light beams in it. And I did light paint the, the boardwalk there. This again is that same lighthouse, but now it's from the other angle with the visitor center in front of it. And I, I kind of got rid of, there's a, a parking lot like right here. So you could see the macadam in the parking lot and I kind of I was far too far back. So that came in there and I just sort of cloned it out with the grass from the other, other areas. This one is, is a recent one that I took last at the end of last year. And I have started playing around with sequitur to combine images. So this one is actually combined about 13 images combined. And one thing sequitur doesn't do, or it might do it, but I don't know how to do it yet. I had, out of those 13 images, I had one or two that I had actually light painted the lighthouse, but when it combined them, it didn't use the lightest part of the lighthouse. So I had to go and, and combine that one sort of manually to get the lighter part of the lighthouse in with the rest of the images. So this one supposedly has, has less noise than, than the others, a single image. So that was, that was the goal there. So I, I kind of like this image. And then my last image, it's, it's the same day and it's also with sequitur, but it doesn't com didn't come out anything like the last one. It's fewer images. This one's only like six or seven images. And it, this one, I have more of a gray and black tone as opposed to the, the bluish tone. And this guy right here, I don't know if you can see him, but he was causing me all kinds of problems. He kept turning on his flashlight for 20 minutes at a time. And he was trying to set up some kind of tracking device. And he was like, he walked into my picture to do it. So I had a lot more trouble getting <laughs> 12 pictures in a row to, to combine in second. And whoops, that's the last picture I have.
Lee, you're on mute. I see your lips moving. Yeah, lips moving. Um, thank you. That was that was great. I especially like the spiral pattern on the lighthouse with the star trails. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. Any comments or questions? I think a lot of those were very wonderful. Um, so uh, thank you for sharing them. You, I could see some progression in your work um, quality wise when, from the first ones to as you got further along. It's, um, it's some really nice images. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And, and uh, it would be fun to go get, get some people together and go out sometime locally. <clears throat> We had planned that and then got shut down from, we had national parks at night scheduled to work with us and uh, then the pandemic hit. Uh, there's a, in the chat, Dave um, put a couple of locations that people should check out um, along with a photographer from the uh, Lancaster area who does um, light painting. Okay, well, Karen. my turn. Sorry. Um, Karen, have you ever been to High Knob up in the mountains of Sullivan County, Pennsylvania? No. Well, the, it's probably a really good place to catch the Milky Way because I was up there late one night and the University of Pennsylvania telescope guys drive up with this giant telescope and they're going to look at the stars all night because it's one of the best spots in Pennsylvania to capture the night sky. So take a look at World's End State Park in Eaglesmere, Pennsylvania, and High Knob. But I'm very impressed that you go out in the middle of the night and do this on your own. <laughs> I would be scared. And it's not only in the countryside. I've wanted to go out at night here in San Francisco where I'm visiting. And I've been told by several people, don't you dare. Once the sun goes down, you you should not be um, by yourself, which was- I think it's scarier in the city than it is out. Yeah. I think it's absolutely. Scary. Okay, well, now it's my turn. Yay. So I'm going to talk about birds. Um, now, it's much later than I expected. Am I going to get too many objections if we go over time? No. Uh, no. Okay. Um, so I've got people on the side of my screen. I don't know how to get rid of that. So I don't know whether you have. Under the view, um, you, can, you can... Pardon? Uh, under the view option, you can make them very small. And then there's a vertical bar, you can push it all the way over. Yeah. Sorry. Um. Try again. Oh. There you go. Note to self, for your splash photo, don't use one that's covered in dust. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to talk about birds in flight, birds mating, birds nesting, birds eating, birds fighting, and then, if there's time, birds of all sorts. <laughs> birds in flight, these are obviously the hardest to get. It's very easy to photograph birds uh, resting on a branch, but, the, but they're not nearly as exciting as birds in flight. Um, so how do you get birds in flight? If they're a big bird, it's fairly easy, but these particular birds, the dusky wood swallow, are very quick and very difficult to catch on the, on the run. But fortunately, they have a bit of a tell, and that is just before they're about to fly, they give a little twitch. And I kept watching for a while and eventually worked out and timed it right so that I got them in flight. And it was just fortuitous that he happened to be doing handstands when he took off. 
The other time you can catch them is when they come into land. And I found this one um, had a nest and although it'd fly off when I came up, it would do a few circles and then come back again. I managed to catch it just as it was landing. This is the lilac breasted roller from Kenya. It's the national bird of Kenya and it's one of the most beautiful birds in the world, in my opinion, but just about impossible to catch in flight. Um, they don't give any indication which direction they're going to go and they don't give any indication when they're going to go. Um, so I caught this one, but as you can see, it's been heavily processed, but at least you can see the various colors. Here's another one, which is out of focus. And another one, again, heavily processed, but you can see the colors. Wandering albatross, on the other hand, is um, a very, very good subject. It flies very slowly. And when you're on a cruise ship, it just uh, kind of floats along beside the, beside the ship, which allows you to get photos like these. Going to talk about life cycle. Obviously, it starts off with mating. These are two whistling kites. It was a matter of uh, 90 seconds, and then wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. And ma'am flew off with a branch for the nest, which brings us to nesting. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a little eagle on its nest, and this is the uh, partner coming back with some padding. We're fortunate that at our farmhouse, there's some bush at the back and there are four eagles, a family of eagles that visit regularly. Um, now this one has picked up a quite a large branch and it's gonna take it off for its nest. You can see here that it's flicked the branch up between its tail feathers, presumably to make it easier to carry. And then on the fly, it starts to shape the stick so that it will fit in the nest. At the other extreme is the king penguin, which just finds a rock and sets up, um, lays its egg and then keeps its uh, chick under its uh, lower feathers for as long as possible. You can, it's hard to see, but there's a little browny gray uh, chick sticking out the bottom. Here's a better photo. Very cute, but really only a mother could love it. This is Australia's only stork. It's called a black neck stork, um, which is rather odd because it's got an incredibly beautiful bright purple neck. And it's gathering some reeds for its nest just going past a egret. Back to the albatross, they make a big cup-shaped nest and the um, eggs are laid and then the chick stays there. In this photo, the uh, chick is about to be fed. Uh, just prior to feeding, the mother will come up and then the chick will rapidly tap the beak of the mother and then the mother opens the, the beak and the Chick puts its head in there and somehow or other the food makes its way in. Eating. Um, the Australian pelican, like most pelicans, takes a big mouthful of water and hopefully there'll be some fish in it. Uh, here's one um, in Victoria and a little cormorant looking on. It then tips its head back and the water and hopefully fish flow down into its neck. And this one just got caught by a gust of wind at the wrong moment and left this rather hilarious image. And the cormorant seems to be quite bemused. Other fish, other birds um, like to take it a bit easier, have a lazier approach to getting food. This Brahmini kite is trying to harass the turn to drop the fish that it has in its bill. You can, if you look carefully, you can see it's got a fish in its bill. 
Um, if it dropped it, then the Brahmin would be able to catch the fish uh, on the surface because it wouldn't be swimming. Um, we watched this one for a while and the tern held onto its feet. Back to our wedge-tailed eagles. This one has grabbed a bird from a branch, a small bird from a branch, and is now pulling the feathers off it as it flies. And I understand that um, eagles are one of the few birds that can actually eat their prey while they're flying. Uh, this photo was taken at a, a um, raptor uh, display in Kazakhstan. The photo, the photo of the bird is real, but uh, I used Luminar to get the dramatic background. This is a small Australian bird called a Rufus Whistler with a caterpillar. Uh, these are a couple of eagles with a dead kangaroo. They didn't kill the kangaroo, but they will eat carrion. And this gives a bit of an idea of the size of the bird. Um, this is on our biggest river, the Murray River, and this is a whistling kite. It's seen a disturbance in the water. You can see the lower part of the photo. And it dives down and grabs the fish. It's a bit hard to see in this photo, but in this one, you can see it, and you can see it even better in this one. And now it's flown off to a branch to enjoy lunch. This is a welcome swallow, which is very similar to your barn swallow. It's captured a, a dragonfly. This is an interesting uh, picture. This was taken in the Masai Mara in Kenya at the time of the wildebeest migration. Um, obviously there's a wildebeest carcass there and the marabou storks and the Nile crocodile are fighting over what's left. Uh, I guess the crocodile has the advantage is if it catch a, it'd be quite happy just to catch a stork and eat that and this cause the storks are very rare, wary. I called it dance macabre. Another example of opportunistic feeding. This is a Gentoo penguin in Antarctica. And it's just regurgitating um, krill. You, if you look carefully, you can see it's some red material uh, coming from the beak and the chick is eating it. The sheath bill flies at the mother who jumps away and continues to regurgitate the meal, but it falls onto the ground and the, neither the mother nor the chick will eat the krill from the ground. So the sheath bill swoops in and gets a free meal. After they're finished eating, the penguins just like to chill out on the beach. And rather than get up and go to the toilet, they just squirt out in a nice straight line. Birds sometimes fight. These two guys are chasing each other and they catch up and sort of arm's length and then get in a bit closer. Uh, this hawk, didn't take, kind, take kindly to its photo being taken and had a go at the photographer. So it's a dangerous job, this. Bee eaters are one of my favorite birds. Um, they occur in, uh, well, from Africa through to Australia. I don't think there are any in the Americas. They're very pretty, very small, but um, like, the other lots of other small birds are very fast and very hard to photograph when they're on the move but lovely when they're still this one's just caught a butterfly and this one is the one that one that got away um, i was all set to go but it just took off and that's all i got i managed to stop this one but of course he was behind a branch so i haven't actually got one decent photo of a uh, bee eater in flight. This is a little bee eater from Africa. Another one. He's getting ready to go, but I still missed it. This is a little green bee eater from Sri Lanka. Pelicans are another one of my favourite birds. Uh, I love this photo because the lake was so still, got these beautiful reflections. Both the pelican reflected in the water and the water reflected in the pelican. 
this one is one of my luckiest shots. I just saw a movement off to the side, and got the camera up and, and snapped and just managed to get the tip of the bill in. Um, now we're back to Africa. This is a great white pelican on Lake Nakuru in Kenya. They, uh, I think it's a common thing with pelicans, but they form these rafts and then uh, make a circle with their heads on the inside and then dip their bills in to catch the fish. This one's doing it and it just lent itself to a high key uh, rendition and uh, it's one of my favorite photos. Penguins are another really cute bird. Um, my wife took this photo, so I can't take any credit, but I love the way, first of all, the water's stopped around it and it's made a shiny sort of shell over the back. Um, the seal isn't trying to eat the penguin, it's just messing with it. Uh, the king penguins have some awesome dance moves. Uh, this little guy is still in his uh, fur coat. He hasn't shed it yet for his tuxedo. These penguin photos were taken in South Georgia in the South Atlantic, and there are huge colonies. This one has about 30,000 penguins in it. But there's always a face in the crowd. And this little penguin seems to be eyeing off this um, enormous mountain. Uh, raptors are another interesting species of birds or range of birds. Um, again, these pictures were taken at uh, a raptor park in Kazakhstan. Uh, I don't know the name of this owl, but it's impressive. Love the eyes. This ugly guy is a bearded vulture or a Lamagaya, and it's it only eats bones, um, and it can swallow one up to nearly a foot long. Uh, quite a sight to see. Back to our eagles. This one was taken off our back veranda, and these are flying through one of our paddocks. Uh, it reminds me of the flight of the Valkyries. One minute. This one just catching the morning sun. And these are a couple of juveniles with their uh, Afro haircuts. This is another raptor, a black shouldered kite, which is quite a pretty little bird. Now, I don't know what this bird is. It's from South America and I'm sure somebody will know, but it's very beautiful. Caspian tern uh, preening itself, uh, a pelican tying itself in knots. Took me a long time to work out what was going on. Um, sunbirds are a beautiful variety of birds which occur in um, Africa and there's one species in Australia. Um, another bird which is interesting is the jacana. It's called the nicknamed the Jesus bird because it appears to be able to walk on water. Uh, and that's because it has enormous feet, which it puts on the lily pads and doesn't sink. Their feet are the largest in relation to the size of any uh, animal in the animal world. Flamingos are always good for a pretty photo. Uh, and this is a red-tailed cockatoo, which is an Australian bird, um, which is close to being endangered. Rainbow bitters, pitters, gorgeous little birds and pretty easy to photograph. Now, my wife tells me my time is up. So in fairness to everybody else, I'd better stop. Thank you. Any questions? 
Beautiful birds. Mm. Great job, Lee. Thank you. Um, lucky to be able to find them. Mm -hmm. Very impressive images, Lee. I, I love some of the ones in flight. The eagles are just gorgeous. Yeah, they're pretty magnificent. Lee, you uh, said those one, are those are in your backyard. Well, it's a big backyard, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They're fascinated by the camera, and a couple of times they've flown over specifically to look at me. Those last three with um, the sun, the morning sun on them, just if flew, I guess, half a kilometre just to hover over me and look at me. So that was very kind of him. <laughs> I like the one that included the moon. Yeah, that was cool, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. You have one with the Milky Way. <laughs> no, I haven't got any night photography um, and they don't come out at night anyway, but you know. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, Thank you very much to the participants, Bob, Vince, Jay, Bill, Debbie, and Karen. Um, as I said at the start, the idea of this was to see if we could generate any enthusiasm for small group meetings. So it might be nice if in the chat or emails to Bob, um, people express their opinion. Well, you got Thank one you. from Barbara and one from Mia about the uh, enjoying tonight. Um, and from Jeff. So they're in the chat. Check it out. Good. Yeah, and I'm, I'm hoping I'm hoping some of the enthusiasm spills over to some meetups. Um, maybe we can meet at night at the, one of the parks, Dark Skies, um, the bike race, uh, the uh, I don't know what else we can do, uh, the birds. Cemetery. Um, Cemetery. Cemeteries, yes. Like like Jay said, they don't they don't run around and run away from us. So, <laughs> yeah, perhaps uh, perhaps we can do that. Uh, we'll co we'll coax Vince into doing one of those with us <laughs> at night. We have to do that at night. Um, okay. Jay, when you when you turn this off, uh, you'll get um, a document with the chat. Uh, if Lee doesn't get a chance to see it, uh, then uh, you can send it to him. Okay. It'll save to your computer, typically. Okay. Okay. Hey, hey Vince. You. Uh, a friend of mine has a whole bunch of uh, round carousel trays, Kodak, for slides. I think they hold like 120 slides. I don't know, you know, it's sort of an out-of-date thing but is anybody interested they're free if i brought home any more of those my wife will will probably throw me out i have probably thousands of them i'm trying to figure out what to do with all mine um i don't know and 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 i i got an email through the web also somebody's donating some stuff i'm going to go pick it up tomorrow i don't know what it's I don't know what it is, but she wants to donate it to get a tax write off. So um, it sounds like there might be some things that the club can use. So um, uh, some of the little stuff, maybe we'll post. Yeah, we can put and, that in the newsletter, Larry, if you shoot an email to Ginny. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Lee. Yeah, thank you, Lee. It's a good idea. We should do this uh, once or twice a year at least. Yep. So while we have a few other people on, I'll just throw out, I'm doing, I'm in San Francisco visiting my daughter's family and our granddaughter just turned 15 and I got her a um, pinhole camera and we went out and we did two rolls of film and the process images just came back and pretty neat stuff. The uh, pinhole is the equivalent of an F-138. <laughs> so it has basically infinite depth of field and the, the a couple of the shots are pretty cool and that's what zeb andrews does who you know of he's yes a, he's i bought it from his store i i used zeb as my advisor and bought it from oregon blue moon yeah the zero image 2000 two and a quarter square six by six yep 
Oh, and, and if, if nobody saw it, we are going to have a, a meetup on the 19th. It's in the newsletter. And Sunday is the deadline for the yes. competition. Okay, guys. Thank All you. right. Good night. Thanks, Lee, for putting this together. And Jay. You're Thank welcome. You. We hit, um, I think, 43 people. Pretty nice. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.